Welcome to episode four of QFT, a compelling journey. In this episode, we finally begin the process of merging together quantum mechanics with special relativity. To do this, let's summarize Einstein's postulates of special relativity. Number one, the laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames. Doesn't this sound like a good candidate for a symmetry transformation? So in this video, we'll have to identify what an inertial frame is and then we can study transformations between inertial frames. And we'll identify them as symmetry transformations. Number two, the speed of light is the same in all frames of reference. So consider a frame of reference S. Suppose for some reason, we know that S is an inertial frame. Now consider a new frame of reference S prime. If it turns out that S prime is in an inertial frame as well as S, then we know that the transformation between these two frames is going to be a symmetry transformation. Special relativity, and even more so general relativity, is understood through the perspective of manifolds. The idea is that the underlying space-time itself is a real physical thing that exists, and in the case of special relativity, the manifold is called Minkowski space. Although the underlying space-time exists independent of anything humans concoct in our feeble minds, in order to understand space-time and do mathematics, we have to add a coordinate system to space-time in order to label points. If the space-time itself is a set of points called M, a coordinate system is an assignment of values for space and time at each point. In special relativity, we can find coordinate systems that cover the whole space-time, so we don't need to worry about these, those technicalities, which any watchers familiar with general relativity are aware of. Therefore, we can think of each coordinate system as a function from the space-time manifold M into the four-dimensional real numbers. But any physics must be independent of coordinate system, since this is an arbitrary choice that we've made as humans. At each point P in M, there exists a vector space TPM called the tangent space. You can think of this space as being the set of all vectors tangent to curves that pass through P. Any given coordinate system can be used to find a basis of the tangent space at a point P by taking the partial derivatives with respect to a given direction. So we use mu, um, and mu equals 0, 1, 2, and 3 to label the first, second, third, and fourth entries in the coordinate functions x and x prime. If a vector v in the tangent space TPM is to describe something physical, we know that it must be independent of basis. So we can see that v mu e mu equals v prime mu e prime mu, where v mu and v prime mu are the components of the vector in the two coordinate systems x and x prime respectively. From the definition of the basis vectors, we can see that under a change of coordinates, the components of the vector must satisfy this transformation rule. For some watchers, this may suggest a radical change to the way you interpret what a vector actually is. If you think of a vector as an arrow that moves from one point to another, then ditch this idea right now. This is the wrong way to think about what a vector is. A vector exists only at a point. At every point in space-time, there is a different vector space, and a vector has a magnitude and direction, but only exists at a single point. Later on, we will talk about vector fields, in which we assign a different vector at each point in space-time. As well as vectors, we can have objects with p raised indices and q lowered indices called pq tensors, where p and q are both positive integers. You may have realized that the transformation law for a component of a vector is simply the components being multiplied by the Jacobian matrix for the change of coordinate system. A pq tensor transforms under a change of coordinates by having one factor of the Jacobian and one factor of the inverse Jacobian for each raised or lowered index respectively. So now that we know how things transform under a change of coordinates, which will help us identify transformations between inertial frames, how do we know if we are starting with an inertial frame in the first place? See, in Minkowski space, we have a 0, 2 tensor called the metric. In any inertial frame, the metric is a diagonal matrix with one positive and three negative signs. We can use the metric and its inverse to raise and lower indices of a tensor. Any sum, which we'll call a contraction, over one raised and one lowered index 
gives something coordinate independent, since a raised index transforms with the Jacobian and the lowered index transforms with the inverse Jacobian, so these transformations will cancel themselves out. We adopt the convention that any repeated index is summed over. All three of the objects on screen, and any crazy contraction you can think of, will always give something that is independent of coordinate system. Now we know what an inertial frame is, and how to deal with coordinate transformations, we are ready to study the Poincaré group. Under a change of coordinates from x mu in frame s to x prime mu in frame s prime, if s is an inertial frame, then s prime is inertial if the metric remains unchanged. We know how a 0 2 tensor transforms under such a transformation, so this gives us the defining relation for Lorentz transformations. We define the Jacobian matrix to be lambda mu nu. Since eta has constant components, this is at most a linear polynomial in x. So we write x prime mu of p equals lambda mu nu x nu of p minus b mu. The translation for vector b mu is the position of the origin of s prime in s. The following two identities follow directly from the equation above. Firstly, an almost identical uh, identical relation, but with the inverse metric. Secondly, an expression for the inverse of lambda. There are two popular conventions for how to write this inverse. I will stick to the convention on the far right, because it leads to less cumbersome notation down the line. These transformations form the Poincaré group. We can find the group composition law by considering two successive transformations from x to x prime, and then from x prime to x double prime. Another useful formula here is the expression for the inverse of a transformation. Unfortunately, the Poincaré group is not a connected Lie group. So naively it would appear that much of the work we did over the last two videos doesn't apply. However, the Poincaré group has a lot of notable subgroups. Firstly, if we restrict to transformations where the origin remains fixed, i.e. there's no translation, then we get a subgroup called the Lorentz group or O13. This is the generalization of the orthogonal group ON, which preserves the length in Euclidean space that we talked about in episode 2. Preserving the length can now be understood as coordinate transformations that don't change the metric. For ON, the metric is just the identity matrix. In this case, the metric we are preserving has one positive sign and three negative signs. So O13 is the set of matrices lambda mu nu that preserve length in Minkowski space. These matrices can have determinant plus or minus 1, and the naught naught component is either greater than or equal to 1, or less than or equal to minus 1. If we restrict to determinant 1, we get the proper Lorentz group, or SO13. Unlike with SO3, where restricting to determinant 1 removes all the reflections and gives us just the connected component of the group, or the rotations, SO13 is still not a connected Lie group. However, if we also restrict to lambda naught naught greater than or equal to 1, we get what's called the proper Orthochronus Lorentz group, or SO13 arrow. This is a connected Lie group, and over the next few slides we will explore exactly what the transformations in this group correspond to. A very useful finding is that any element of the Lorentz group is either a proper Orthochronus element, or it's a proper Orthochronus element combined with one of the discrete transformations P, T, or PT where p equals parity inversion, and t is time reversal. So the Lorentz group is really four disconnected components, and the discrete transformations p, t, and p, t move you between components. Each connected component is characterized by the four combinations of whether the determinant is plus or minus one, and whether lambda naught naught is greater than or equal to one, or less than or equal to minus one. The main takeaway here is that we can study the proper Orthochronus Lorentz group as a connected Lie group using all the techniques we've been using so far in these, in these videos. We then just need to study parity inversion, time reversal, and the product of the two, and then we can build up the entire group. We can also consider elements of the proper Orthochronus Lorentz group, but bring translations back into the fray. This is the connected component of the Poincaré group as a whole. Um, as far as I'm aware, there isn't really a technical name for this particular group, but when we refer to proper Orthochronus transformations, sometimes we will include translations as well, and it will be obvious what we're doing.
Before looking at more general representations of the Lorentz group, we should study the matrices lambda mu nu, which make up the four vector representation. This is the representation that four vectors, such as the energy momentum vector, transform under. We will find it useful to study infinitesimal transformations. So if we assume that lambda mu nu is the identity matrix plus omega mu nu, with the components of omega mu nu being small, by applying the defining relationship for O13, we find that this matrix omega mu nu, once you lower the first index, is actually anti-symmetric. An anti-symmetric 4x4 matrix has six independent parameters, and we can collect them in the upper right-hand corner of the matrix. We then usually take out a factor of minus i out of the generators, as we have done in previous videos. By separating out each independent parameter, we can find an expression for the generators with both indices lowered. We then raise the first index to find an expression for the generators that seems quite abstract. In the next few slides, we'll interpret what these transformations are. We know that there are six free parameters. So recall from the previous video that we can pick any six linearly independent generators to characterize the transformations, since these would form a basis of the Lie algebra. The most natural choice for physically interpreting the transformations is to define three of them by taking ji equals a half epsilon ijk jjk, where epsilon ijk is the levi civita symbol. In matrix form, this just gives the three generators of rotation from our study of SO3. But what are the other three degrees of freedom? We will see that these generate boosts in the x, y, and z directions respectively. To interpret this, we need to consider a transformation that isn't infinitesimal. We find this by taking the exponential of this generator times some parameter. So suppose we take k1, we should get a boost in the x direction. Now this looks very similar to a rotation, but with space and time rotating into one another. The only difference here is that rather than having sines and cosines, we have the hyperbolic trig functions, cinch and cosh. The parameter beta is usually called the rapidity, and since cinch and cosh are not periodic, Rapidity can take on any value from minus infinity to infinity. This makes the Lorentz group a non-compact group. But in what sense is this a Lorentz boost? Let's consider two frames of reference, S and S prime, with S prime being the frame of reference boosted by a velocity v in the x direction relative to S. If a particle of mass m is at rest in S, then its form momentum should have a time component of m and a spatial component of zero. In S prime, the particle should have some momentum in the negative x direction. So after transforming, its new form momentum is multiplied by the matrix lambda mu nu. This gives the form momentum after the transformation of m cosh beta as the time component and minus m cinch beta as the spatial component. If we identify this with a standard Lorentz boost, we find that cosh beta equals gamma and cinch beta equals gamma v then the relative velocities of the frame of reference is tanch beta. If we plot a graph of tanch beta versus beta, we can see that as the rapidity goes to plus or minus infinity, the, velo the velocity asymptotically approaches plus or minus one. Since we are working in natural units, this is equivalent to asymptotically approaching plus or minus the speed of light. So SO13 arrow, it is a connected Lie group, and the transformations are boosts in the x, y, and z direction as well as rotations about the x, y, and z axes. The group SO13 arrow is a connected Lie group, but also if we add translations back into the fray, it's still connected, as we mentioned earlier. So let's try to figure out what properties the generators have as operators acting on a Hilbert space. If we have an infinitesimal transformation, x prime mu equals omega mu nu minus epsilon mu, with epsilon now being an infinitesimal translation, we can, we can expand the operators representing such transformations about the identity. It can be confusing to get the signs right on these terms. So here's a quick little trick to get the sign right on the translation term. Recall that we are defining our transformations passively, i.e. the coordinate system changes, but not the physical states themselves. Consider a function psi of x. If we translate our coordinate system i.e. we move the zero of the x-axis to the right by a constant amount b. We know that psi prime of x prime, the function in this new coordinate system, 
equals psi of x, since we are not transforming the function itself. Now since x prime equals x minus b, we find that psi prime of x equals psi of x plus b. Then we can tailor expand to first order in b. We remember that the momentum operator in quantum mechanics is minus i d by dx, because of course h bar equals 1. So we find that psi prime of x equals psi of x plus i b p hat acting on psi plus terms of higher order in b. This might seem inconsistent with our negative sign for the operator on the left, but recall that epsilon rho p rho is actually epsilon naught p naught minus epsilon i p i. So their negative signs cancel out on the spatial components. We can then use the group comp composition law to sandwich an infinitesimal transformation between two normal transformations and obtain two different relations for this. Since omega and epsilon are both small, the terms on the right hand side are also small. So we can expand both sides about the identity. The algebra here gets a little messy, but it's not too difficult and it's good practice of using tensor notation if you take the time to work it through. We equate coefficients of omega and epsilon to find two nice relations satisfied by the generators. The second one here is easy to interpret. It just tells us that the four momentum generators transform as a four vector, as we would expect. The first term is also consistent with our identifications of J as Boosan rotations. Firstly, if there is no translation, it transforms as a rank two tensor. But if we have a translation, the extra terms are a quantum mechanical analog of what leads to the parallel axis theorem in classical mechanics. We can use these two identities to derive the Lie algebra for this group. We make the transformation infinitesimal on both sides of the expression and equate coefficients as we did before. This gives three relations. The first is the Lie algebra of the proper orthochronous Lorentz group. The second tells us the commutators between boosts and rotations with translations. The third tells us that all four components of four momentum commute. This is huge news because it means we can find simultaneous eigenstates. In fact, in next episode, we will express the Hilbert space in an eigenbasis of four momentum. But then we can recast the Lie algebra into operators that are more familiar to us. We define the four momentum operators as the Hamiltonian and the free components of momentum. We define the boost generators and rotation generators, which we interpret as the angular momentum operators, as we did on the previous slides. This then gives the Lie algebra in the form we will use it more often than not. Firstly, the Lie algebra of the proper orthochronous Lorentz group, which of course has the SU2 Lie algebra, as well as two more identities. To finish off the video, we'll have to talk about projective representations. I promised last video that we had already done all the hard work in this department. We can construct a homomorphism that is eerily similar to the homomorphism between SO3 and SU2. Any Hermitian complex 2x2 two two matrix can be expressed as V mu sigma mu. V mu here is a 4 vector with its index lowered, and sigma mu is a 4 vector of sigma matrices, with sigma naught being the identity and sigma i being the standard Pauli matrices. The determinant of this matrix is v mu v mu, i.e. the length of the four vector in Minkowski space. So if we can find a transformation that preserves the determinant, we can use it to define an element of SO13. It also, of course, has to preserve hermeticity. We won't discuss every detail because of how similar this is to before, but any transformation of the form beta v beta dagger, where beta has determinant 1, will preserve the determinant. This defines a homomorphism from SO13 arrow to the set of complex 2x2 two two matrices with unit determinant. The kernel of the map is Z2, as before. So this gives the isomorphism of the proper orthochronous Lorentz group with the quotient group of SL2C, which is the name we give to the group of 2x2 two two complex mat matrices with determinant 1. This is exactly like the relationship before. In fact, pretty much all the details carry over. Firstly, SO3 is a subgroup of the Lorentz group, and SU2 is a subgroup of SL2C. In fact, if we consider the homomorphism as being a function, and we restrict it just to the elements of SU2, we actually get the exact same homomorphism from last video. Everything else carries over as well. The fundamental group of SL2C is a trivial group, and the fundamental group of SO13 arrow is Z2.
So from now on, we can just find representations of the Lie algebra. And we know if we, if we exponentiate, we may get a representation of SL2C, but this is just going to be a projective representation of the Lorentz group. And that's fine. So that pretty much wraps it up for this week. Next week, we will look at representations of the Poincaré group and show how we can use them to describe the states of single particles. The properties of spin and helicity will naturally drop out of this formalism. Classifying Hilbert spaces in terms of Poincaré group representations is called Wigner's classification.